Viewers like you make this program possible. Support your local PBS station. This is beautiful. I grew up with this. I know this song's <laughs> flavor. I didn't know that the diaspora of Portuguese, Brazil, and Capoeira had such a big imprint in Boston. We immigrated from the Azores to pursue the American dream. Being Capoeirian is an event. Yes. Welcome to Brazil. Exactly. <laughs> And the food really preserves the stories between these three communities. If you represent the Portuguese culture, you see food. When, when I eat a dish like this, I taste West Africa, but not with the pork. That's the Portuguese influence. <laughs> I love this clay pot. It's so unique. It's an indigenous influence. When I look at this food, I see Brazil. Between the native, between the African slave, between the Europeans, right. it's all mixed. Now I'll show how to be gaúcho for a day. You have sausage, chicken, pineapple. But this is such a fun way of eating. What are the things that the Portuguese, Capo Verde, and Brazilian care? Portuguese, the language, bring us together. Food bring us together. And the way that we can treat each other also bring us together. Always have one extra seat because there might be hungry sweet Ethiopian coming by. Yeah. <laughs> the <Shabbat laughs> and the Samuel side. I'm Chef Marcus Samson, and as an immigrant born in Ethiopia and raised in Sweden, food to me has always told a deeper, more personal story. It's a path to culture, identity, and history. Join me on a new journey across the country to learn more about America's immigrants' communities and culinary traditions to see how food connects us all. When I think about Boston, I think about sports, education, history. I also think about it as a port town, where seafood is really king. Think about lobster roll, oysters, cod, and chowder, and all of these different dishes. Whether it's Portugal itself, or Capo Verde, or Brazilian culture. It makes sense that the diaspora of a seafaring country finds its new home in a port town like Boston. Portuguese is spoken by over a million people in the Massachusetts area, so it makes it the third biggest language after English and Spanish. Portugal is not a big country. It's actually smaller than Indiana. And during the 14th and the 1500s, it was one of the first big superpowers, right? It traveled all over the world, it explored, and it brought traditions, rituals, foods to these places, but also colonization is part of that. Cap Verdean, Brazilian, and Portuguese culture. Where does one start? It's so distinct and different. And I'm super excited to dive in to all three of these rich cultures and countries and see how they have made Boston their new home. So to really get the Portuguese community, you really have to go back to where it started, which is an hour south of Boston in a community called New Bedford. The New Bedford is this quintessential New England seafood town, right? It's windy, there are fishing boats everywhere. I'm excited to go and meet Captain Enrique Franco. He's the captain over a boat called Mary Kay. You good? So how, how many days we are? We were out for six days, doctor. Okay. And you got about 30, 40,000 pounds? Around 40,000 pounds uh, fish on board. So we got cod, haddock. Redfish, pollock, grizzle, grizzle. And this is your father who taught you how to fish from the beginning. I right? threw. Yeah? yeah. So when you came to America, you came as a fisherman already. Yes. yes. I was in Portugal in school, but I want always want to be a I fisherman. Start, I start 14 years old. And you always have the same crew, or same crew for 18 years. Nine. They're getting old. Four of the crew. Seven years old. Yeah, it's you. Not much. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> 75, the oldest one. So I want to be fishing for at least 10 more years. Yeah, yeah. It's nice to go out, right? Your office is so beautiful. Like, oh, yeah, this is my life. Yeah. This is my life. We just start cooking. You're going to help us. I'm ready, I'm ready. Going on the boat was really exciting. 
My Swedish grandfather was a fisherman, so it made me reminisce about growing up on the coast of Sweden. Right away, I went down to the galley. Oh, wow, you got a real kitchen here. Yeah. You, you got a good sit-up. You like an espresso? Yeah, I would love an espresso. So I'm going to cook with Enrique's father, El Cinde. Little did I know that he's basically like a master chef. What would you call this in Portuguese? What do you call a chowder in Portuguese? Uh, shorta. Shorta, yeah. Shorta. Shorta. Yeah. So maybe the word comes from the Portuguese. Maybe, actually. maybe, maybe. Yeah. This stock smells so good. I put the onions. Yes. Olive oil. Yes. Portuguese olive oil. Yes. Yeah, Not Italian olive oil. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> The fish is already here, cook. Oh, this is a beautiful yeah. halibut. Yeah. We're gonna flick yes. it up a little bit? Yes, yes. we're gonna do yeah. exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. I mean, you can't eat better than this. This is just it's the freshest. You freshest. Wow. Like, that's how we do it. Now we're gonna put a handful of rice. I have small hands compared to you, there so. There you go. There you go. Chef, look what I have here. You're coming with a secret ingredient yeah. now. <laughs> nice dessert. Woo! Oh, camarones, now. This is almost like a chowder meets a paella, something in between, paella, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Two minutes, it's it. I'm now gonna taste better for sure. Huh? Wow. You like it? I love it. <laughs> nice. I love it. Got it. It's light, it's fresh. Now I put the rest of the, the rice of the air. Put the on top. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Oh, we're gonna eat. Zap day into this shower to look the same as Popeye. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, sit yes. down, my friend. All right. Ah. What a fish. So in the middle of cooking with El Sende, Chef Joe came on board and he brought these incredible Papa Secos. They're the perfect vessel to just scoop up this incredible stew, the light, and they're really crusty. They're absolutely delicious. Very good. All good. Very good. Thank you. Fantastic. What a way to start the morning. The Portuguese start. <laughs> Obrigado. Are you here the story? The history why they say they call the shorta? Yeah, I want to know. The big ships when they were fishing, they years were ago, eating. Years, years ago, many years ago. They were eating. And they asked the other guy, how, how is the food? Yeah. The food. And the guy said, this is so good that makes me cry. That makes me chorar. So uh, maybe you're right. The shara come from yeah, Shurar, I mean, crying. Right? Right. The guy put the name is Shara. You know what? I'm going to tell you that. If I lose my job, I know who took it. <laughs> <laughs> I know who took it. This is so good. What do you want? This is it. The Portuguese that came to New Bedford were primarily Azorians. Azores are a group of nine islands about 800 miles off the west coast of Portugal, pretty much in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. For economic reasons, for reasons of overpopulation, when whale ships would come to the Azores, it was seen as a very viable alternative to staying on the island and dealing with the conditions there. During the 19th century, New Bedford was a very wealthy, cosmopolitan, industrious area. There were constantly whale ships coming and going, and so it was a good place to settle. In 1958, there was a volcanic eruption on the island of Fayal. Many Azorians were displaced, and so Azorian immigration very much increased during that time period. Chef Joe, him and his buddies, they have this cooking club where they go all out. They're really into preserving the Portuguese culture, right? So their dishes are mostly rooted in dishes that you will not find in traditional Portuguese restaurants. There are game meats, there are anchovies, there are offal cuts, there's all this stuff that goes back to the grandparents' days, right? They're really honoring their grandparents and the heritage by still presenting these dishes. And most of these dishes, they're not recipes. Oh, what is this? 
Octopus. Oh, that's a pulpo? Oh, nice. oh, yeah. So what, what, so that comes from red wine? What's the color from here? It's, it's really simple ingredients. Red wine, paprika, onion, garlic. A little bit of beer, because my grandfather used to put beer. Yeah, it's yeah. You have to have beer. Nice. And then over there is migas, made with chickpeas, one of our most favorite beans in Portugal. It looks almost sort of southern. This is definitely you know? a southern dish with the corn and the right, kale. exactly. Everything. But it's not. It's Portuguese. Right here, we're going to give you the honors right now. This is called chouriça bombeiro, the fireman chouriça. OK, OK. So light it on fire. Oh, OK. Jim, yeah. you want to show them how to do it? Yeah. I almost, I almost killed myself. No, it's on, 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 it's on. Nice. Hey! The dishes just kept coming. There was this incredible fresh cheese that was so nice and mild, but really distinct in flavor. Good, right? Hearty cooked rabbit, Portuguese fritters made with bacalhau. In general, Portuguese food is a little bit saltier than an average American palate. But that's also what makes it distinct. All the food we have on this table was passed down through our grandparents, our parents. If they didn't pass it down to us, we wouldn't yeah. have the record that we have today. And it's good that you keep these dishes alive because, you know, they might not yeah. be around. If Absolutely. My oldest daughter, her favorite food when she was Five or six was from sardines. Yeah. But I, I, I have a 10-year-old, a 50-year-old, and a 20-year-old who will eat the octopus all day long. Oh, nice. No problem at all. And the food is delicious. Thank you, man. Thank you. And you guys have this community. You should take very much value it, because everyone don't have that. Through That's thick, what it's all about. Through thick and thin, you can guys have each other, you know? And thank you so much for inviting me to your amazing community. Always have one extra seat, because there might be a hungry, uh, hungry sweet Ethiopian coming by. My name is Michael Benavides. We're at my family business, Portugalia Marketplace, Fall River, Massachusetts. We immigrated from the Azores to pursue the American dream. My parents worked various jobs in textile mills locally, and my father dreamed of owning his own business. My father started the business in 1988 in a three-car garage in the back of a tenement home that we lived in. The business kept growing, evolving organically to service the ethnic community that exists here in Fall River. Beyond the food items, we're focusing on artisan-made goods from Portugal. It's also some non-traditional, some more contemporary products that exist in Portugal today. The country has evolved tremendously since. With this market, we've been trying to bring what's happening in Portugal currently here locally. I would say that the market is a cultural experience. We have people who come in here all the time and tell us they feel like they're being transported to Portugal. There's a certain amount of responsibility as well. A lot of these folks have entrusted us with this role. This is so much more than this place, this business. So when you walk into this marketplace, how are you? Good, what a nice place. Oh, thank you. You see everything from the standard stuff that you might think about, sardines, olive oil, olives, of course. But then there's also these things that you might not think about. Ceramics, different types of artwork. It's a really humbling experience because you realize how much the Portuguese culture has given to the world. Tempura that we think about Japan, that comes from Portugal. Think about beverages like port wine, chilies, right? Chilies to Africa. So the Portuguese as a country today might not be super big, but the impact it's had in terms of trading and food is massive. One of the coolest things we has its own bacalhau room, right? Not just a little bit of bacalhau, its own room. I grew up with this. I know this salt flavor. I know it. I know it. It's familiar. These are, these are shreds, bits, so trimmings. That's that's a, a pollock. This is this is uh, the the cheeks. Yeah. So, and then these are the faces. The Portuguese aptly named it the fiel amigo, meaning the faithful friend. 
because they could depend. You could always depend on salt cod. You, yeah. you look at no Portugal in the country or in the yeah, interior; they didn't have access to, to fresh products. Yeah. You're talking years ago, so so that you could always have sheets of this in your pantry. How long can this hold? A very long time. There's no. I mean, you can honestly, hold the, the cod fish in your fridge. You can for for two years and no problem. Yeah. Bacalhau, probably the dish that is sort of the biggest impact of Portuguese food, right? So the Portuguese come up with this technique that is you hang it and then you salt cure it. And then kind of a mix between air drying it and salt curing it creates this super strong flavor. So when you get it, you got to soak it maybe for a day. You just rinse the water and then it comes back up alive in a different way. The texture gets almost bouncy. Bacalhau is a flavor enhancer. You can put it into a stock, and all of a sudden, you get that salty, fishy flavor. People all over the world are using bacalhau, all the way up into northern, northern Norway, to the Azores, Brazil, Cap Verde. You know what I think is amazing? You know, the world goes so much faster, right? But something like this, a tradition that is like 1,000 years old, people are still using. I love that, you know what I mean? Like, this is very old world, yeah. yeah. How have you seen the Portuguese community change over the years? There was a time, you know, there was sure. this assimilation time. Assimilation, there was, yeah. and there was this sort of, you know, uh, I, you know, identity yeah. crisis in my Don't Portuguese, in my not. There were the generations before us who the parents insisted that their kids only speak English. You know, they in the house, household they spoke Portuguese amongst themselves. But I would just say that that's gone. I mean, it was a, a proud moment for us to open this market when we have customers walking in for the first time. Some of them would choke up even, or yeah. give us a hug, and feel like that they were responsible uh -huh. in some way to for this. For Contribute this. to the culture. I mean, yeah. people are very, very proud. You know, Ronaldo, yeah. Mourinho, <laughs> uh, Portugal. You know, there's a lot of different reasons to be proud, and, and this market is part of that story. New Bedford is considered the Ellis Island of Cape Verdeans because for over 100 years, between the years 1800 and 1921, 70% of Cape Verdeans came to the US through New Bedford, and many stayed. Cabo Verde is about 400 miles off the west coast of Africa. Cabo Verde was the first subtropical colony. It was primarily occupied because it was a great place to engage in the transatlantic slave trade. And so the Portuguese settled there in 1462. The issue with Cabo Verde is there are frequent droughts and famines. What we see time and time again in whaling journals and throughout the 20th century is that it was decaying and, and very much mismanaged. And in 1975, Cabo Verde got its independence from Portugal. So what often happens when a colony gets its independence, the country that was colonizing it also takes its infrastructure and its leadership with it. So there are some growing pains. So in the 1980s, there was another influx of Cape Verdeans to the US. Sometimes the history is tough. You think about haves and don'ts have, about slavery, and it's not easy. But Cape Verdean and Portuguese comes together here through food, language, and culture. I'm going to deep dive and learn what does it mean to be Cape Verdean American. So I'm meeting Candida Rose, is amazing American Cape Verdean singer at Izzy's, which is this cool little diner. Welcome to New Bedford. How are you? Oh. <laughs> what a nice, cozy place. This place, you're sort of right in the heart of where everything is happening. What's good here? What should we be having? I know uh, they have Jag. What, wait, whoa, 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 what is that? It's so different configurations of yeah. rice and beans. I think here they do um, rice with kitty beans, and, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's what I grew up with. But there's also types of Jagasida that is not yeah. rice. It's like um, some kind of milled corn. I think where you can taste both Portugal and West Africa the best is really in Jagasira. It has fried rice and beans. It has Portuguese sausages. This is hearty food, but it's also delicious. This is Jag for me. You know, I grew up in Gothenburg, which is a port town, so I grew up with some Cabardians, so I know about the culture a little bit. It's not a country that you hear that much about 
What should we know about it? It's mm. really a mixture of all of the influences from Portugal, from Africa. I mean, it's right in the shipping route in the Atlantic Ocean where the early explorers mm -hmm. were coming from. Then you had folks sort of stopping for fuel and sometimes staying. And so because we have all of this mixture, we all look different. I mean, the slave trade went through Cabo Verde. So actually, there's a city in Cabo Verde called Cidade Velha, mm -hmm. and it's the first trading post of slaves. Cape Verde was used almost as a teaching place oh, wow. for, for slaves before they ended up going to places like Brazil mm. or wherever else they went yeah. from there. So Cape Verde was definitely a huge piece. Yeah. And I don't think people really know and understand mm -hmm. how huge of a piece yeah. it was. When did you know that I'm going to be a singer, I'm going to be a performer. I'm actually going back and seeing my culture. Mm. I've been singing for as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. and my music comes from this mixture of who I am, of my Cape Verdean and mm -hmm. my American influences. There's Hunana and the Batu, which are more from our African side. Sure. And those were the music that were sort of sent underground yeah. during the colonial time. and. There's Marna, like Cesaria. It's almost like a bluesy kind yeah. of a, not necessarily in the feel of the music, but just in what is being brought forth sure. in through her voice and, you know, what we've been through. The biggest star to ever come from Cap Verde is Cesaria Evora. Her voice cut through everything. You hear about hardship, you hear about people, labor, and all these songs, almost like a blues song. So it's just done through a very, very beautiful melody. Food, music, it's such an incredible way to experience a new place. It gives sort of these images. There are songs with the Marna that will mm. definitely sort of pull at your heartstrings. Immigration is, is, not, is not an easy thing. That transitioning from, you know, from Cabo Verde to wherever in the diaspora. Yeah. So all of that comes in through our music. Back in Boston and excited to see Candida perform at Restaurante Cesaria. One of the biggest things that we got from Cesaria Vora was to explain Cap Verdea to the world. And that's also something that Candida Rose is doing in Boston. I'm gonna meet Tony and Jose, our co-owners. They've done such a good job curating the best of Cup Verde. The minute you enter, it feels like home right away. And it just gives you this like warmth and sense of community. Stage, you own this moment. Thank you. Come on, can we do a big? Okay, here we go. Yeah. Omlagado, <laughs> salud. Yes. So you guys have had the restaurant now since 2002, which makes you an institution. Tell me a little bit how the restaurant evolved. Was it music always? Because the music seems to always be part of Cabernet heritage. To be honest, the first thing we ever put in this restaurant before, even the furniture, was the piano. We felt we can't do food without music. Food connects us and music unites us. We had to give our people a full experience of Cape Verde. I love these dumplings, though. This is pastel de minju. The dough is made with sweet potatoes. Oh, that's why it's orange. That's, that's our secret. That's really good. <laughs> So when did you come to America? I came in 77. We, majority of Cape Verdeans used to come and settle either in Rock Spring or Dorchester. Yeah. Did you relate to the African-American community? Were you part of the Cape Verdean community? I grew up uh, with uh, Cape Verdean friends. You know, I had friends who were from other races, but uh, we stuck together. I came during the busing era. When Tony arrives to Boston in the early 70s, Boston is in the middle of what is known as the busing crisis. In 1974, a federal judge tried to integrate Boston's highly segregated school. 
by ordering 18,000 black and white students to take buses to schools outside of their neighborhoods. The process was met with massive protests and violence. Yeah. Um, so I went to school at South Boston. Yeah. And it was scary. Yeah. <laughs> we got through it. Even till this day when I walk through there, I kind of feel yeah. weird about it. But yeah. the city's come a long way. It made you who you are, right? Yes, yes, yeah. it did. Oh, that's beautiful. Cabritada is the stood goat with the yuca. This is stunning. So when you came here as an adult, how did you respond to the American food? Was that different, or did you eat Cape Verdean food the whole time, or? Cape Verdeans, when you come here, you cook your own food. You cook your own food. Cape Verdean has this thing that where you go, you bring Cape Verde with you. We very strong on that. Here we go. This is stunning. It's cachupa growing up. This was manchupa for me. Why? <laughs> it was just a different word. Cap Verde, each island is completely different. The culture changed from one island to the, island other. to the other. And even this, different islands make different versions. It's a very hearty dish. So this it's is the corn. cassava flour? Corn. corn. Majority of our traditional dishes are made from corn. Because it's a dry climate, we harvest the corn, we dry it to save it. We throw in pinto beans, baby lima beans, collard greens, linguiça, pork, beef. When you eat cachupa, you sustain the whole day. The whole day. When, when I eat a dish like this, I taste West Africa. In Senegal, you could get a similar dish, but not with the pork. I think that that's the Portuguese influence. No, I don't know. I don't know if uh, the pork was influenced by the Portuguese. It, it, there is some little touch. Influenced by the Portuguese? Uh, Portuguese people eat a lot of pork. Yeah. So It's OK. It's OK. Uh, I love that, though. But you held up the flag very good. <laughs> I'm proud of you. My couple of men is It's OK, <laughs> man. <laughs> So we're in the heart of Roxbury. This is yeah. Dudley Street. A lot of people like to call it Cape Verdeville. Though I feel like other Cape Verdeans who live in like Dorchester would argue that yeah. this is not yeah. the heart, but it is. But it is. <laughs> yes. Shauna Barbosa is an amazing poet, goes between LA and Boston. I'm Roxbury, ride or die, born and raised. So this is my stomping ground. Growing up, like your grandmother, your mom, like what did you speak at the home? Criolo. So yeah. I learned Criolo uh, from my grandmother and my stepmother. So it's a dialect of Portuguese. Yeah. And in Cape Verde, like all the different islands have yeah. like, you know, different sure. accents and different dialects. Shauna writes from this sort of Verdean, but also very much modern point of view. This double dual identity is part of her narrative. Shauna grew up in a classic row house, which on every floor that family members, both on the, her African-American side and on her Cape Verdean side. She's invited me home to cook Sunday dinner with her stepmother, Louisa. We're gonna cook together? Yes, we are. Good, I'm we excited. We're gonna make magic. Cape Verde is a home cooking culture, so I have to come to her house if I'm gonna get a real Cape Verdean meal. What are we making? So we're making bacalhau, gratinado. Bacalhau, nice. Yeah. How long did you soak it for? Four days. Four days. You rinsed it? Yes. That's and great. I cleaned it. It's mm -hmm. ready to go. So it's cod, sauce, potatoes? Potatoes. Mm -hmm. I have my potatoes ready right here to go. Oh, like French fries? Yes, I'd like to use those. I love that. So besides this, what is the staple in Cabrera? Is it rice? Or what do you what do you eat like on every day? Like rice every day. Every day. You gotta have a rice every on you. Day. Every single yeah. day. Okay. Look, can you go without rice? No, yes, now I can. No. I but it used to be hard. It used yeah, to be really used difficult. To. It used to. You live in LA now. You don't you don't miss it? Like you don't miss the food? I miss it a lot. So every time I come home, I it's make my deal. rounds. Yeah, yeah. yeah like it's a, it's a big deal. Like everyone make dinner, like everyone cook for me and it's like relax. But having Cape Verdean food is just like there's nothing like it. But it smells good now. So we have our onion, we have a garlic. We don't need any more salt in here because you have all no, the salt in the world the salt, in here, yeah? Correct. Okay. And then here you have milk. I have milk. A little butter, butter. and spices. Are you taking notes? I am. <laughs> I'm, I, I really am. So 
I'm cooking a bacalao gratin with Louisa. And it reminds me kind of like the Swedish cod that I grew up with. Sometimes we had leftover cod and we put in a sauce and baked it off. But it's done a little bit different. And then you come in with the cheese after. Correct. Like, She's got to have cheese. Yes, the cheese yes. goes on top. What makes this specific Portuguese Cap Verdean is that the fish is bacalao, but also we top it off with black olives and then putting it in the oven. Guess yeah. what? We're also going to have couscous. Auntie. Ready? Oh, you're bringing the next expert in now. I yes. see that. <laughs> Ooh. First project done. So we call it couscous. So you, you grate yuca. Yes. And then what type of flour is this? So this this is flour. flour. OK. Mm -hmm. Mix it all in. Yeah. So we're going to add in a little sugar. Sugar. Sugar <laughs> and cinnamon. Cinnamon, too. Mm -hmm. I don't like cinnamon. No, 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 no. This is a lot of sugar. You got a lot of sugar. <laughs> I like a lot of sugar. <laughs> wow. What texture are we looking for? Like when you hold it, it's not, if it doesn't feel too dry, right here it's too dry. More water? Just a little bit. OK. Uh, that, that's, that's a little great. bit too much. You know what, this chair is great. Like, listen, we got it. Thanks for your assistance. Yeah. Oh. It can be rectified. Yeah. OK, do we check? I think that's good. Yeah, good. Auntie, did you make couscous like back in Fogo when you were growing up for your brothers? Yeah. Yeah? So I didn't <laughs> get enough to uh, Really? Yeah, get it on prep. When I hear the word couscous, it makes me think about Morocco and Northern African foods, right? But this was something else. This was kind of like steamed, almost bready-like. It's hearty and firm. Beautiful. And I can see why people that work really, really hard, long hours, labor with their hand, this is a really good dish for that because you're not going to go hungry. Oh, wow. Let me give you a butter. That's good, and that, that will hold you. Even if you're a kid, you go to school and... Oh, it fills right, you, you up school all day. day and that's, yeah. that's all you don't do until you get home. Mm. It's not like you have lunch at school like yeah. here. Yeah, <laughs> no. Wow. Are you going to eat your food? Mm. No, I ate my hand. Okay. I see, how many people in Cabo Verde eat this with a fork? I would love to no, see that. No, you use it with your hand. Morning. Exactly. <laughs> no. Right? You use it yeah. with your hand. Now it should be time to take out the gratin, right? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Of course, when the food is ready, people started to come out of the woodwork. People just kept like drip, drip, drip coming in. How, how many are we? I'm trying to figure out how many are. So we got cousins, uncles, aunts. You can definitely tell on Sundays, this is the spot for Shana's family to come together. We have to have rice, right? Of course. Thank you. Mm. This is really good. You did a very good job. Thank you. Nice. You too. Kevin, what do you think about the Cap Verdean culture? Like, did you know people from Cap Verdean growing up here? Or? When I was in college, one of my friends, he was Cape Verdean. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, where you come from? He said, oh, I come from Cape Verdean. Me not knowing anything about Yeah, just Cape being like, Verde. Kevin from the state. I said, Cape Cod, I go there yeah. every summer. He said, no. So. <laughs> You know, a lot of Americans probably will think that, yeah. A lot of years later, mm -hmm. that's when I met my wife. Just around that whole area where she lived was all Cape Verde. Mm -hmm. So Boston is an interesting place, and Boston is super segregated. Black people live here, white folks live here. And it was always like that. However, because it is segregated, I was around my people all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really like how we keep the sense of community and keep the culture together. But also within the culture of Black, you really represent, you know, we're not monolithic. We come from many different places. I am in the middle between both of these cultures that I I feel like I have the best of both sure. worlds. Absolutely. Marcus, you've had bacalhau from Portugal. Yeah. And Brazil. Mm hmm And now Cape Verde. Yeah. Oh, no. All right, you already know what I'm going to ask you. Cape Verde is winning. <laughs> Clearly. OK. We'll okay. see. Otherwise, I'd have to, like, figure out how to walk out the back door. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin is winning. He knows. <laughs> Brazilians had been coming to the U.S. since the 1960s, trickling in. Boston was a prime place for Brazilians to migrate to because you had an existing Lusophone community, which simply means Portuguese speaking. Brazil was a South American colony of the Portuguese. 
The intention was to extract resources. And so what we have in Brazil is a history of slaves being brought over to provide free labor, indigenous people being displaced, and Portuguese people managing it. What has come of that is this very mixed culture. I think Brazilian food is the house that's been layered with a bunch of bricks, right? So Bahia in the north is more African. In the coast down to Sao Paulo and Rio, you have more European influences. When you go further into the Amazon, it's more indigenous culture. All of that is Brazilian cuisine, and it's very unique. I'm excited to go and learn from them, to eat with them, to drink with them, to celebrate Brazilian culture. When most people think about Cambridge, maybe they think about world-class universities. But for me, as a chef, I think about this little restaurant called Mukeka. So today, I'm meeting Chef Fafa. Just like a big Brazilian soccer star, she has a cool name, right? It's Ronaldo and there's Fafa. So what is this? Those are clay pots. It's all handmade from my wow. town in Brazil. What's your town? My town called Vitoria is an island mm. in Espírito Santo state. Mm. This reminds me actually of clay pots in Africa. We have a lot of uh, you know influence from Africa yeah. also, but those mostly made by the Indians. It's an indigenous influence. <laughs> Today, you're gonna make moqueca. Moqueca. This is very important in um, our moqueca cooking. This is urucu, urucu? In Indian name. Yeah. So we take the color from the seeds. Mm. I already have prepared with olive oil. You can put a little bit more. A little bit more? Uh-huh. Mm. Beautiful. Then, so we're starting with onion and garlic? Yeah, just a little bit of garlic. I can put the tomato in now? Yeah, and the cilantro. And the cilantro. This, put this layer here. Just use the fish. Just it's like a cod or? This is haddock. Haddock, okay, yeah. got it. Now we're gonna cover to finish. I love this clay pot. This pot keeps the heat and the flavor. So if someone that have never had Brazilian food, the dish is like moqueca is definitely one that we should make, right? Right. But I've heard about this dish called feijoada. Everyone knows feijoada, because Every feijoada we have all over Brazil. Feijoada is different from moqueca that comes from the Indians. Yeah. Feijoada is from Africa. Yes. The slaves brought the yeah. feijoada to our, you know, mm -hmm. culinary things. So these are beautiful, sort of like black beans, right? Yeah, so here we're going to put the, uh, all and the it's, meat. It's, it's beef, right? Beef, we have pork. Mm. And sausage? Sausage. In Brazil, they used to put the pieces of the meat that the senhor, the donor, doesn't eat. They mm. throw it away. Throw it away. The slave get that, mix with the beans, and cook for themselves. Oh, yeah. So it's all the leftovers goes in, simmer together. So moqueca is ready. So oh, this is going to be beautiful. Should we add in some shrimp or no? Yeah, I like everything well decorated. Yes. Yeah. The color on top. Oh, my okay, God, it smells is, good. Is... Should I take this out? Yeah, well, that's because everything is done. Yeah. Ooh. Wow. When it boils so... like that, woo! The orange helps to digest the feijoada because it is heavier. This, for me, is absolutely gorgeous. And I love the flower on top. The farofa. Farofa is everything. Beautiful. When did you come to America? I come when I was 33 years old. Mm -hmm. And one day, one friend decided to come to West for good. He said, I want to go there because it's very hard to make a life in here in Brazil. But I've never been in the plane, yeah. so I'm afraid to go by myself. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to go with me? We can go together. That's amazing. Since I was like five, I was inside the kitchen. I want to work in a restaurant. Yeah. But it was very hard to find a spot. Nobody wants to give me a chance because I didn't have any experience. Yeah. And one day I was so mad and I told to myself, you know why? I'm going to have my own restaurant yeah. to get experience. So I work hard. Yeah. Because I believe in myself. You're here between MIT and Harvard and run this successful restaurant for 19 years. Well, you made a life for yourself and it's meaningful. You bring the community together. Yeah. 
What an inspiration you are. Thank you for coming. Thank I'm very you. happy to have you here. There are 312 fruits in Brazil, and I would say that most of them aren't here. The whole idea of Zingbo was bringing healthy Brazilian fruit to the U.S. and make a difference. Açaí comes from Amazon. It grows in very tall palm trees, and the way they harvest the açaí is the same they used to do years and years ago. Açaí has everything in it, good carbo, good fat, minerals, nutrients, and protein. Tapioca, indigenous as well. It was before colonization that the Indians were using it. And it kept up north for years and years. And recently, I would say, the last 15 years, it started to get popular down in Rio de Janeiro, down in Sao Paulo. Put it in a pan, it sticks together with the heat, and then we fold it exactly as a taco. It's always summer here, you know? So a happy vibe, a good vibe, a very energetic vibe. We truly felt the connection between Rio de Janeiro and Boston. And we can make it a bit different with our culture, with our music, the food. I think that's really the mission that we have, really show what Brazil has and, and really bring something different to the country. So Mestre Chuvisquinho is a capoeira master that grew up in Brazil. I'm excited to go and watch a class. Capoeira is this incredible art form. There's a mix between dance, music, spirituality, and history. It's all in Portuguese. What a cool way to learn about Brazilian culture, but also about Portuguese as a language. Mestre Chubisquinho, he has invited me to a pastelaria. The food normally in a pastelaria is really street food. It's snacky, it's something you eat on the go, and it's a really important connector to the community. Oh, this looks good. Huh? This looks You're just... Welcome to Brazil. Exactly, <laughs> this just looks like a cafe in Rio, Sao Paulo, anywhere. This is the beauty of Brazil. Yeah. This is called Salgado. If you walk around yeah. the streets of Brazil, like Salvador, Sao Paulo, Rio, yeah. especially Bahia, you especially see all the Bahia. Bahia selling, you know, acarajé and all of that. Here we have empada. Also, you're gonna have different types of coxinhas. There's one with cream cheese, which yeah. is called catupiry. You have bolinho de bacalhau. Oh, with the cod, with the yes. salted fish? Exactly. Nice. When I look at this food, I see Brazil, right? Because Brazil is also a country between the native, between the African slaves, between the Europeans. Right. It's all mixed. This looks like a pierogi. This looks like empanada. The bacalhau comes from the Portuguese. Right. Like, you feel... The you see right? the influences, right? Absolutely. OK. But well, you're going to order. You're going to order everything, right? I'm going to go light. <laughs> so acai for the coach exactly. and the fat things for me, OK? <laughs> All right. Oh, acai. Acai. <laughs> Look nice. at that beauty. Beautiful. Full of energy Obrigado. right there. Obrigado. <laughs> Obrigado, Obrigado, querida. That's pastel. Pastel. What's inside? Cheese. Cheese. Cage. 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 Oh. And there's different kinds. You find yeah. meat, you find uh, bananas. Oh, it's delicious. This is like a perfect snack. Exactly. Where did you grow up? I grew up in the streets of Brazil. I was born in Cabana do Pai Tomás. It's a favela in Minas Gerais. Minas Gerais. Yes. Is favela a good word or a bad word? Can we? Well, to me, it depends how you see it, how you look at it. We are living in this neighborhood where poverty was present. Yeah. A lot of happens good stuff, some not so good yeah. stuff in Brazil, you know? I've been to the favelas and also seen a lot of beauties in the favelas. Tell me some of the beautiful things that we don't know about. Sense of community is unbelievable. You're sense never alone. Of, you're never alone, sense of community is strong. Tell me about capoeira. 
it's your passion, it's also your job, but it's also something that been passed down to you right. through generation. Explain a little bit to me about this. I'm the third generation in my family. Capoeira was created by African slaves yeah. in Brazilian territory. It was a way to communicate, not to tell the master. Exactly. I mean, you can't think about Brazil in any facet of its culture without linking it to slave culture. Slavery came to Brazil through the Portuguese. Brazil was actually the biggest port in terms of the slave trade. Over 70% of the slaves came to Brazil and it was also the last country to uphold slavery. It's a very complex, dark part of Brazilian history, something that has had huge imprint, whether it's through music, food, capoeira, culture in general. I think this thing that was created by slaves that was passed over in generation has now become a major sort of ambassador for the country in a way. It's amazing. And as a young boy coming up, it must have been good for you to have capoeira through your father, through your neighborhood, on your right. side. Capoeira was always a, a channel for me to focus in my life. You know, it was literally a, a channel. Yeah. If you go to different parts of Brazil, you're gonna see capoeiristas active, trying to help communities, yeah. trying to help families to raise their kids using capoeira as Beautiful. a tool. And I do think that the combination between spirituality, martial arts, and music and community brings people together. Absolutely. What motivates me the most is I'm able to connect people. Yeah. You know, families were built in my school. Mr. Know? Capoeirista. Obrigado. Obrigado a você. Obrigado. Espero que você tenha gostado. I hope you enjoyed it. Of food. course. It's, it's just great talking to you. Churrasqueria is probably the most popular food outside Brazil. Imagine like a Brazilian barbecue, right? Today I'm meeting Bruno from Oliveira Steakhouse, and he's gonna teach me everything about the gaucho culture. Gaucho means cowboy. It's gonna be really cool. I'm excited. We are doing a picanha. Okay. Picanha is the most popular steak we have in Brazil. Okay. And I'll show you how to be gaucho for a day. So this is like being a butcher back here, right? Yes. We are gaucho chef. Cool. This is yours. Nice. Then skewer the first part. What region of Brazil does this tradition come from? The tradition come from south of Brazil. The gaúchos, they're from Argentina, Uruguay, oh. and part of Brazil. Beautiful. Uh-huh. Nice. Almost gaúcho now. Yeah, sure. <laughs> wow. Looks better than ours, Beautiful, though, beautiful, beautiful. Amazing. And then we just season it with sea salt, that's it? Yes. Are you sure you're not from Rio Grande do Sul? Yeah, I wish, I wish. This is the trick. As we can see here, this one can come down. Yeah. It's cooked already. This one here is still cooked, then we switch with this one. Wow. This way we'll have rare meat and well done, and we can take care of everybody on the floor. Yeah. A real gaucho chef is not only to butcher and cook wow. the meat, but also to make sure we'll have enough, but we will not have too much to waste. To waste. You have sausage, chicken, pineapple. Oh, yeah. We have everything. We have 18 varieties that we offer wow. for our guests on the floor. So in yeah. Brazil, you would do this over open fire? Yes, an yeah, open yeah, yeah. fire pit. But this is such a fun way of eating. It's social, it's fun. And then Quite for the fun. leftover, we make feijoada. <laughs> <laughs> This restaurant is packed. Congratulations. Thank you. How long have you been here? Since 2015. What I love about the meat, first of all, is the simplicity, right? Just that beautiful sea salt, but it's so moist and rich. Yeah. And the nice thing about the Brazilian concept, it's because you can control the service. Yeah. I love this. And if you put in the green, they come and they bring for you small pieces. It's a lighter way of eating meat, too, actually. It is, and give the guest time to talk yeah they come here because this is about share our culture yeah but but meat is expensive this is on a special location if i'm in brazil mostly i eat beans cassava Chica. brazilian people the way that we we do we save some money 
and we like to have a barbecue yeah. in our backyard on Sunday day. Then we invite friends and family. Some one will bring beef, the other one will bring the chicken, oh, the other nice. one will bring the sausage. So it's like a potluck. Then nice. put all together. Oh. You didn't have the pork. You're gonna try the oh, pork? No. Bruno, I'm giving up. Okay, enough. That's it. I can't eat anymore. <laughs> So I'm in Somerville, and I see the sports bar of Sporting Lisboa, this incredible soccer club in Portugal. It looks like a normal sports bar, but it's not. It's also a great place for food. And I'm talking food from Cabo Verde, Brazil, and Portugal. And I'm eating with Paulo, that is the sporting president, and Milena and Robson, and both Milena and Robson works for MAPS. MAPS stands for Massachusetts Alliance of Portuguese Speakers that help guide Portuguese and extended Portuguese diaspora into this new world. Well, what am I having here? This oh my good. God, that's awesome. delicious. Portugal is very famous for the cutfish. Yeah. So we have the uh, cutfish cakes and the shrimp cakes. That's a special for you. Oh, this is oh. delicious. Wow. Mm, that's delicious. Oh, wow. Amazing. Nice, it smells good. What are the things that the Portuguese, Cabo Verde, and Brazilian, I know you share the language, but also culturally, what, what do they overlap? What do they share? We share the, the passion um, for soccer, definitely. Yes, of course. Music, right? Music. Yeah. I think it's the food. Uh, Portugal conquers the world by the ocean. And uh, because of this, if you represent the Portuguese culture, it's seafood. Yeah. Shrimp, codfish, everything about seafood. Yeah. Is it's from the, Portugal. the Portuguese it's world. The, yeah. Nice. The clams are great, no? Amazing. Really, really delicious. What is this? She can explain because she's Brazilian. Yeah. But it's another famous plate, which is the Brazilian tradition. Yes. It's called uh, carne de sol, with mandioca. So it's, uh, you, ha you have the meat and you can dry out the meat in the sun. It's a preserving technique. Yeah, it's delicious. And one thing that I like here is like, um, uh, the restaurant business brings people together. And this place is special because it brings Brazilian, Portuguese, Cape Verdean, everybody together. I do think the migration will always change, but the fact that America is still the land of opportunity yeah. is also amazing, because only in America would you have Ethiopia next to Portuguese, yeah. next to two Brazilians, yeah. and we, you know, we can share our experience. And we respect each other. Yeah, yeah. we share our experience. That's beautiful. I learned in this life that yeah. if you move, you need to find another way. Find, your find your community, which, which you guys are bridging here. Yes. It's all about community. And find what makes you belong to some place. Mm. Portuguese, the language, bring us together. Yeah. Food kind of bring us together. Some costumes and the way that we can treat each other also bring us together. Well, it's been, it's been a beautiful evening. Very you. nice meeting you. Thank you. I will never see Boston the same again. It's a different lens. It's much warmer. It's something that really surprised me and makes me want to go back. It's been fascinating to taste the similarities, but also to find the nuanced differences this trip really reminds me that food is such a unique window in to history. These three communities are forever linked by a super complicated past, and the food really preserves the stories of loss, but it also tells the story of resourcefulness, perseverance, and resilience. It's incredible to see in Boston, these three distinct cultures has forged strong, enduring communities while remaining connected and celebrating their past.